So here is that ship in Savannah that got, that got, got cut. But the, the ship is there, and we will see some other ships as we go along. As I was saying, I did cut things out of it. Uh, you're not going to think so when you see some, how many there are, but there are huge gaps. It's just impossible to get all the historic places because the East Coast is the beginning of our country, and there's just so much history. So beginning at the top, Campobello Island, Plymouth Pan Plantation, Mystic Seaport, the Statue of Liberty, Valley Forge, Philly, Gettysburg, Washington, Williamsburg, Monticello, Kitty Hawk, and oops, I left out of your things. So, all right, so we're going to move on down the coast, starting with Campobello Island, which actually is in New Brunswick. It has a nice rocky coast. It's off the coast of Maine, and why we want to see it is because it was the summer home of the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt family. It is uh, uh, largest and inhabited island in, in um, New Brunswick off the coast, a uh, small population. But uh, it, it, on it is this international park, which is, belongs to the United States and to Canada. The other one that I know of is Waterton in uh, the Rockies, where, where we have an international park with Canada. So this is just a little bit of Maine coming in from Boston, Portland, Bangor. You would want to go along the coast. Actually, this is really like this along the coast. Very slow drive over here to Lubeck and across the bridge to Campobello Island, which is right here. So that's where you would be heading to if you wanted to go to Campobello. And this right here is uh, the small part of the island, which is the enlarged right here. The, the uh, Roosevelt compounds are right here with some of the other cottages here as well and visitor center. And as you saw from the picture, there's a rocky coast. There's lots of hiking trails, wooded, uh, really a pretty, pretty place to visit. A couple of lighthouses. So these are some like the, the walking trails that you would see on the island. Several small hotels, just kind of mom and pop kinds of places. No, nothing really big. So this is the Roosevelt Cottage. Uh, you might say, hmm, cottage. <laughs> At least I would. <laughs> so it also, whoops, and also, I'm going to have to be easy on the finger. It also includes these three cottages, which are more cottage. There, one you can get uh, some um, lunch and another one for high tea. So they're part of the Roosevelt Garden, uh, Roosevelt uh, compound, and, and of course, beautiful flowers that they have all around it. So the house was completed in 1897, and the, the Roosevelt family, Franklin and uh, Franklin's parents, lived next door. And this house came up for sale, and so they bought it as a present for uh, Franklin and uh, Eleanor for their wedding. Uh, in 1921, this is where he contracted polio. As they were coming here in the summertime, he was a big sailor. Uh, but he didn't let them stop him, of course, from going on to become president. Uh, he was in a wheelchair. Uh, after he died, uh, the house was bought by Armand Hammer, and, or after Eleanor died, I should say, and he deeded the property to the governments of the U.S. and Canada where, when the park was then established. Okay, come on. So you can tour the house, of course, and it's just left as it was in the 1920s. So it's kind of fun to see how it looked or how it would have looked when the Roosevelts lived here. You can take guided tours of it every 15 minutes and get tickets at the house the day of it. You, don't, you can't get them in advance. So uh, I remember kitchens like this that my grandmother had. And looking out from the deck uh, toward New Brunswick and another one of the views. Here, here's an old picture of, uh, of FDR on one of his boats. Uh, next stop is in Massachusetts, the Plymouth Patuxet originally called the Plymouth Pant uh, Plantation, and I've had to change that because in the last couple of years it's changed its name to Patuxet, which were the, the name of the indigenous people who were living here. Uh, Plymouth, the town of Plymouth is just right above it in this little bay where the, the Plymouth Rock is, and the, the town of the Plymouth Plantation or this restoration is uh, just south of that. So here you see a larger view of that. There's a spit of, band of land that protected the bay when the, the Mayflower sailed in. And uh, the, the um, May Mayflower 2, the uh, new one, the, um, rep the uh, replica of it is in uh, Plymouth Harbor. And they do have a few houses here. 
But then the Plymouth Plantation was settled down here where uh, some of the types of houses that were in the area were moved and built, built here uh, to represent what it looked like when the, our first visitors, our first settlers, or some of our first settlers moved here. We'll see that wasn't exactly true when we get to St. Augustine. So it was known first as Plymouth Plantation, a living history museum. <clears throat> in, the, in Europe, they call them outdoor museums. In other words, they're buildings uh, not enclosed by uh, a big museum. <clears throat> they have an historical interpreters or as guides who speak and look the way they did. And they will speak as if they are uh, real visitors, uh, re real residents, I should say. And if you ask them a question, they'll say, well, uh, I did this and I did this, and we, we have this, so they act as if they were living in that century. Mary, the different spelling yeah. of the plantation, what's the, so what's that about? I know, I, I, I hoped I could get away from that question, Kathleen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, saw it, I saw it in two places as uh, sp spelled, uh, the way we see it now is P-L-Y-M-O-U-T-H. And then this is the original spelling of it. And I told her, we'll change it to, to Plymouth, the new one. And uh, then I stood corrected. So I, I went back to this. So this is the, the way we know it now. So so it was all like Plymouth Harbor or Plymouth Bay? Yes, it was spelled this way to begin with. Oh, so okay. I went back to spelling okay. So it's one of the Smithsonian museums that I didn't really realize until I started doing this. And you can do a, a, a walking tour through it for not too much money. So it looks like this. It looks like a little village that you might see in the 1700s. Oops, there we go again. Uh, that you might see in the 1700s, built of logs, thatched roofs, uh, not paved streets, so just dirt roads. It's open from late March till November if you plan on going. Um, one of the people in the area, Henry Hornblower, opened it in 1947 as uh, two English cottages in Plymouth, in the town of Plymouth. And as I say, this is where the Plymouth II, the replica, is, is, is still, at it, uh, still there. But then afterwards, they also added these at the location we're talking about now, the, Plymouth, the English village, which is the, this village, and this Indian village, and a visitor center and some other things that you see here. And since I visited it in, two, in uh, 2004, uh, I didn't get to see all of this. But this is what I did see when I was there. So they have people who tell stories about the early times. And uh, this is an outdoor oven that this lady is tending. And she would probably use this countertop to, to put her meat or fish on. And they answer questions as, as, uh, as if they were residents there. And you'll see um, walking um, cows and horses through the, through the village. They're, they're actually cooking meat. So this little group was singing some little songs up from the period. And you could join in on some of the dancing if you choose to. Uh, this is my uh, travel buddy for the time, Anna Marie, with the, the governor of the colony, uh, Governor Brewster. And along with it are some of the Wampanoago uh, settlement, what the Indian villages looked like then and their house. So, so they had some uh, their settlement there as well for you to look at. Our next um, stop is in Mystic Seaport, Connecticut. And this is in the very corner of southeastern Connecticut. And if you've heard of the sound of Mystic, if that rings a bell, maybe you remember Mystic Pizza, which was um, Julie Roberts' first movie. You remember that? Mm. And there is. <coughs> actually a town of Mystic. <coughs> it wasn't Mystic Pizza out of the blue. It was from the town of Mystic, uh, Connecticut, where it was filmed. So the seaport is up the Mystic River a little bit on this little point of land and shows the, the layout of it. It is basically a 19th century seafaring village. So here we're talking 1800s as opposed to 1700s uh, from Plymouth. The uh, big thing right here was uh, under scaffolding when I saw it. That is the Charles Morgan whaling ship. But I will show you what it did look like. And of course, there are all these other things that you can see <coughs> in the um, in the village. And one of them, uh, the, the, um, the the Charles Morgan is listed here, but, but we'll see some of the other uh, ships that are, are still there. <coughs> so it was established in 1929 as an historical, marine historical museum one of the first living museum history museums. 
and it has about a quarter million visitors a year, quite a few. Here's the Charles Morgan, our picture of it looked like what it would look like under sail. It was the last wood whaling ship. It was acquired in 1941, uh, launched from New Bedford, and if you like whaling museums, there's one right down the coast in New Bedford, a uh, very interesting one. So it had a crew of about 35 and sailed for 80 years, which is really amazing. When you think of the high seas and the shipwrecks and um, weather and all the things that can happen to wooden ships over a period of years, this is really astounding that it made 37 uh, voyages lasting three years or more over that period. So it was really built to, to last, and it, and it certainly did. It was a, described as a National Historic Landmark in 1966. So in the village, there are a number of different kinds of um, sea, seafaring types, and you'll see some lobster pots down here. Oh, I don't really want all this. That's, I guess it's going to show anyway. <coughs> Can you see the um, captions on the bottom? Yes. Okay. Joseph Campbell? I'm not seeing them anymore. My, my share screen is on there. Oh. So this is the Joseph Campbell, yes, and, and I wish I could tell you what the purpose of this ship was. I wasn't able to find that information. We were able to go on board and tour it. I'm not sure if it held passengers or cargo or what exactly it did. It has been uh, completely refurbished and it is a really pretty ship. Um, Mary, is was the whaling ship still in existence? Yes, it was, yeah. there. It was, it was completely in scaffolding when I saw it, so I didn't have a picture. Oh. Okay. So, um, substitute that one but that is kind of their their main uh, it, I think it's uh, that that work has been done now that was quite a while ago as I say when I was there in 2004. I think Stan was saying that you can get a ticket and go out. Yeah I would think so. You could, go on, you could go on the uh, Joseph Campbell as well. You probably don't catch any whales but you could sail. No it's whaling days are over I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Lots more at the New Bedford Whaling Museum if you're interested in whaling. But there are a lot of things that you can see in Mystic Village, uh, like the ship figureheads and really this whole feel of a, a seafaring village, um, about 60 historic buildings, so that's really quite a few. Most of them are commercial buildings, um, such as this uh, hardware store and general store, a little church, and we even had a graveyard, a bank, a, a tavern. And of course, you can go through the houses of the period too. And these are, as I say, 1800s. And in the museum, of course, they do have a visitor center museum. They have all kinds of things about shipbuilding. Uh, and this lady was showing some of the figureheads and doing some of the wood carving. And if you want to get around, you can take a buggy ride, which is nice. And you can see that I was there in the fall. Our next uh, stop is at the Statue of Liberty in New York slash New Jersey. They both claim um, title to that. It's right at the entrance to uh, the Hudson River. It is got a whole lot of um, sites uh, saying it's a U.S. UNESCO and a, a national monument for us and on historic places and so forth. So it uh, from New York it is really closer to New Jersey. This part's from New Jersey. You can get to it from the New Jersey uh, terminal which is what I did <coughs> with my friend Dee. Uh, which goes first to Ellis Island and then to the Statue of Liberty and then back. Or you can take basically the same thing from the New York uh, Lower Harbor and uh, Lower Manhattan and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Lanny's nice um, presentation on New York, I think she included about going to, to, uh, to Liberty Island from there. So this is one you don't see usually, the New York, uh, the New Jersey terminal. This is where it looked and the New Jersey skyline. So the uh, ships for, come in first, these ferries first to, to Ellis Island, and this is what it would have looked like. My friend Dee was already elderly when I picked her up to do this. She had not been to the, the Statue of Liberty since her children were small. And so uh, she was, like I am now, she get, gets up late in the day and can, is lucky to do one thing a day. So we have a really slow start. We didn't have time to go to, to Ellis Island and for me to take her back um, and then go down to, the, to uh, New Jersey for my Evergreen stay. This is, of course, pulled off the internet. I didn't uh, take this one. 
So you see it's on an island. You can see there's a walkway all around. There's a bunch of statuary through it. To the bottom part is the museum. The ships pull in here. There's a cafe where you can have some something to eat. So the, the Statue of Liberty is on a lot of things. This is on a cheese, <laughs> the same, same view as I had here. Um, and there are three people that uh, were involved in the making of it. Of course, we know that it was a gift from France. And so these are French people who had the idea to celebrate the 100th year of our independence, uh, found themselves a sculptor. To, and of course, you will recognize the name uh, Eiffel, who designed the Eiffel Tower to help with the engineering and to show some of the uh, influence of the symbolism that goes into the Statue of Liberty. Uh, this is a, a statue that uh, La Boulay made of Eiffel, and it's hard to see his head. He looks like he doesn't have a head, but it's right here. Can you see his face kind of leaning back <laughs> with the Eiffel Tower? And some pictures of it from the back and from the front. It was constructed in France in pieces and then shipped to the United States. So this, these are some of the crates that they're building or scaffolding as they're building it and the interior, what it would look like with the staircase. And originally people could go up into the torch and into the, the head and the uh, crown, uh, but um, they have closed this, they closed this part a long time ago and they now closed this, I think, in 2016. Uh, but you can still go up, or since the pandemic it was closed too, but you can go up now uh, up to this point, I believe. So these are just some pictures in the museum about when it was under construction in France, and you see all the people working on it. It is uh, made of copper, 151 feet tall from the base of the statue up to the torch, and this would be the torch right here that she's holding. Or if you want to start from the ground all the way to the top, we're talking 305 feet. And why is it called Liberty? It was named after the Roman goddess Libertas, of course, meaning uh, that, that symbolism being this is the, the goddess of liberty, uh, which represents the United States. And this torch standing for the enlightenment and the way to freedom, illuminating the path to, to liberty. And another picture from inside the museum. And you see in her left hand, she's holding a block, which is a statue, a, a, a stone block, a, sta a tablet, which has the Roman numerals of the date of the Declaration of Independence. And we're missing this last one. Underneath, she has one foot raised, and she's been standing on some chains. So she's releasing herself from shackles coming to the land of liberty. These rays coming out from her crown, which, which is why Liberty wears a crown, this is right here, represents the glowing light of a halo uh, in the New World. And of course, when it was completed, there was a huge celebration in New York Harbor with all the fireworks and so forth for, for, for um, unveiling of it. We're all familiar too, I think, with the title, with the poem from the New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, giving her tired, your poor, uh, it's set to music as well. I, I learned it singing it. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This was not originally on the Statue of Liberty, but a friend of hers found it years later. It's, it's the first part, I'm sorry, the last part of a longer poem that she had. And the poem wasn't very famous until her friend found this last part and uh, and uh, it was then put on the a plaque and placed on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty and where it is today. And of course, there are people now who say, mm, I don't want your homeless anymore. I don't want your tempest tossed. I want you having uh, a couple of degrees and, and uh, no debts and otherwise we don't want you. So there's some, um, some controversy about whether we still are the um, place for immigrants. And of course, most of us are that very thing. We are immigrants unless we were slaves or original people who lived here, we are all immigrants. So that is our welcome to New York, um, tears in the eyes of any immigrant passing into Ellis Island and seeing the statue for the first time. This is a picture looking back toward the uh, skyline of New York from the Statue of Liberty. We'll move on now to Valley Forge, which is uh, representative, I guess, of our Revolutionary War. Uh, we might look at this map just for a second. It's on. Uh, we're looking at the Delaware River because we're going to come back to Philadelphia next and see that it's in between the Delaware River, the main river going out to the ocean, and the Schuylkill River, which is a smaller river coming off the Delaware. 
So this is where the, uh, the city of Philadelphia was. Valley Forge was just up the river a bit, about 35 miles if you're driving from Philly. <clears throat> and it was on 3,500 acres. Uh, a picture of Washington on his uh, winter encampment in the winter of the third, the third winter of the Revolutionary War in 1777 to 78. And this is a, be a better map of where Valley Forge is. Uh, <clears throat> if you're coming from Philadelphia, you'd be going out towards King of Prussia and Phoenixville, where my friend Marie uh, I was visiting. Uh, the road is well marked, the highway is well marked. Um, lots of roads that will say to Valley Forge, you, you really can't get lost unless you really work at it. So Valley Forge is a National Historic Park. Uh, this is Marie and we are standing with some revolutionary soldiers in the visitor center. Uh, that Revolutionary War lasted eight and a half years. It was a long slug. Uh, and the Continental Army camped at Valley Forge, as I said, during that third winter. They built about 1,500 cabins, uh, 14 by 16 feet. They didn't have a housing. They had to build their own place to stay over the winter time. And though they were difficult and the army was exhausted, you sometimes hear they starved to death and they had no clothes. Well, it wasn't quite true. They did have food. Sometimes it was a little scarce on the meat, but they, they had uh, meals every day. Uh, their clothes was pretty shab were pretty shabby. They did get uh, new, new ones made and those repaired. They did have replacements come in. So there were no battles during that time. The, the uh, English army was in Philadelphia at that time, so they retreated from Philadelphia. Uh, but they had mostly no battle, they had no battles, but they did have a lot of disease, mostly flu and typhoid. So by May, uh, they were able to uh, leave Philadelphia and go on to New York where the, the uh, British were and uh, engaged them there. So this is what, they, what it might have looked at, like at that time. I was surprised to see women in this picture. But in fact, there were women. We're going to see about that in just a minute. Uh, this is the home where uh, Washington uh, had his headquarters during this about six month period. And uh, there are lots of plaques and um, statuary through the park that you can see. Uh, after, after the encampment and after the war, these, the 3,500 acres were given back to the farmers whose farms they had requisitioned and they tore down all these log, log cabins and replanted the trees they had cut down. So these log, log cabins are just replicas of what had been there during the winter. They aren't the original ones, but this is, this is what they would have looked like inside. So about 12,000 people were here, but including women and children. There were fortifications uh, that uh, alliance with the French also in May uh, gave them some extra uh, French troops and Lafayette to move on to battle the British. Whoops, I left an eye out of that word. Uh, so the, what was interesting though, not only about Valley Forge being a, a winter place, it was the birthplace of the American army as we know it today. Because at, at this time, remember there, the, that there was not a country. There, there were just um, militias in the various states. And so they kind of got basic training. Who knew you could do such a thing? And had professional officer corps and uh, broke into different groups who did different things like the Corps of Engineers. So getting a, a, a real army during this time was really the outcome of this um, little respite that they had for the, a few months from the war. And around the uh, grounds, as you'll see, the, the all kinds of um, weapons and uh, other things. This is the big memorial arch that was put up when uh, what we've celebrated our first uh, centennial. Uh, and if you can't read this at the top, this is what it says. Naked and starving as they are, which is not quite true, we cannot enough admire the incomparable patience and fidelity of the soldiery. So let's move on now to Pennsylvania, to uh, Philadelphia, which is really the birthplace of our country. Uh, it is called the City of Brotherly Love. As we know, the, uh, the Dutch and the Swedish were actually here first, and there is even a German town in Philadelphia, so it is not really an English town, even though it was, um, the land grant was given to Philadelphia along with part of Delaware, which had already been given to Lord Baltimore. Oops. Uh, and the Quakers were with him, so we say it was founded by English, 
but it had been explored earlier, but they couldn't get together and actually plant a flag and build some houses. But we can say it is a city where our country was founded. Here's where the Declaration of Independence was written, the first Continental Congress, where these, these 13 states got together and said, yep, we're gonna, we're gonna ditch the king and go for it. Our first Constitution was written here and signed in Constitution Hall. It was the first capital of Pennsylvania and of the new country, so temporarily our first capital was in Philadelphia. And this is the Delaware River along, right along the bank, the Schuylkill on the other side, as we, we said from that first map. Lots of things that you can see as you look around the map. The old city is right along the Delaware. Uh, Independence Hall is, is right in this area. Since my daughter lives right across from Philadelphia, uh, across Ben Franklin Bridge, about a 10 minute train ride on the, the train into downtown Philly, uh, I have visited several times. So it isn't, these pictures are not from just one time in Philo, Philadelphia. As you see, even on the map, it says to Philadelphia National Historic Park, et cetera, et cetera. So you're gonna find that well, well marked if you wanna go to Valley Forge from there. And the other thing that I really love about Philadelphia is the wonderful art museums that they have up here. And I'm gonna do a little bit on that. So when you're looking at Philly, you see uh, people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington walking the streets. This is their neighborhood. This is the historic ma uh, landmark for Elfritz Alley, which is the oldest continuous uh, street in Philadelphia from 1713. And I believe there is one of the houses that you can see, but other than that, there are people living there and they ask you to respect their privacy. So this little bit of uh, land in the middle, Independence Hall, is the th home of the Declaration of Independence, where they actually signed it on July 4th. That's our, our, grad our, our graduation day. Yeah, our, our Independence Day. So the, uh, in the Independence uh, Declaration was adopted unanimously, which I found really interesting because they did not agree on, on, any, on a lot of things. They had all different kinds of ideas, and yet this Second Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia said if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it unanimously. How is that for governing? I love it. So what it does, what that um, in, in, uh, Declaration of Independence says, it explains to the King of England, who was a little dense, uh, George III, why they were leaving England and it was the first step in forming the United States of America. A lot of it had to do with um, him, him giving special favors to the East India Company. Hmm, special corporations get, get uh, special favors. How about that? And we, don't, get, we uh, are, don't have anything to say about how we're run here. So our primary author of it was Thomas Jefferson. These other folks had input into it. Just around the, the corner from it is the Museum of the Constitutional Center. And if you look out the window, you will see the Liberty Bell, which was hidden dur during the, um, while Philadelphia was under siege from the English, and uh, Independence Hall. You'll see some, who some of the founders were in this building. And right around the corner, there's a relatively new building open in 2016, my grandson, uh, the, the, America, the Museum of the American Revolution and how that war went. So here are some things from the American Revolution uh, Museum. And here's the, the statue of King George III in New York being taken down. You see the ladder here. Uh, when they, they uh, uh, were objecting to what King George was putting on them, they, they, the first thing they did was yank that statue down. One of the things that really got their ire up was the British coming in and point blank firing at the people in Boston in the Boston Massacre. And that was pretty egregious. One of the interesting things I found in the museum was, was liberty trees in the different towns. Remember, this is the days before even uh, the telegraph. Uh, certainly no cell phones or any kind of communication. You had to send a messenger. So there were trees that had a hole in them or places where you could put up messages. You know, our, our battalion is moving uh, up the, the river a little bit. Here's just to tell you where we are. So I thought there was an, e an interesting way to uh, communicate. The 13 stars were on the first flag. You can see that at the Betsy Ross house. Here she is. <coughs> but actually, that flag was probably not designed by Mrs. Ross. She did make lots of uh, flags for, for states and for Army and Navy units, but 
uh, probably not the actual creator, uh, a cor um, even though her family claims this is so, apparently that is not the case. It did become the, uh, the, the 15 star flag, uh, she may have sewn it, but she didn't design it. Became the official flag in 1795, uh, the, the first one in 1777, the second one in 1795 when the two stars were added to it. Uh, the Vermont and Kentucky were added. Just a little bit, as I say, there's a whole list of things of grievances, but this is the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sound familiar? To secure these rights the, 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 uh, that are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And we want to remember that this is on, on our um, political table right now. Do we want to still be uh, uh, having our power derived from the consent of the governed? Uh, whenever former government becomes obstructive, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government. So this was an issue, a big issue back in those times and why these truths they thought were self-evident. In this uh, uh, house right here, right alongside the, or right, right next to the um, Independence Hall, is, is called Declaration House, which was where this Declaration of Independence, which I was just, we were just looking at, was the uh, beginning of it, was on this site in 1776. Then Franklin, of course, was a big uh, person of note, a, a diplomat, a printer, uh, who um, uh, was very active in political affairs. I'm not going to go into it. It's a wonderful uh, PBS special on him right lately. Uh, the City Hall is interesting, a uh, later building to, to visit. So there's all kinds of other historical things in Philadelphia to see. Washington, the Statue of Washington and Washington Square, another uh, older building. And if you're into uh, the food of Philadelphia, the Italians have a big presence, the Italian market, and as I said, the uh, art museums uh, and the steps where Rocky was. Um, so there's some wonderful museums here. Uh, this is the uh, City Hall uh, looking down. So uh, moving into Pennsylvania, just a little bit away from the seacoast, we come to one of the great battlefields from the Civil War, the uh, Gettysburg Battlefield. It was not the first, but certainly the bloodiest. Uh, July 1st to the 3rd, the three-day battle from 1860 in, in 1863. It was a turning point because up, up to this time, General Lee's um, uh, army, uh, army of the of, of Northern Virginia. I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Army of Northern Virginia had been successful at Brandywine, and I, I, I'm sorry, not at Brandywine. At um, uh, now I can't think of the other battle he had. Uh, coming up to this point, uh, he had been successful and um, now was facing the Union Army or the the Army of uh, Army of. Mm. I'm going to have to remember that one. It's on another slide. It'll come to me. Uh, so uh, fighting the Union Army at Gettysburg. Uh, and what, what it was, it was a turning point because he lost this battle. This battle was lost by the Confederates and uh, it was very, very uh, ambitious, but it didn't happen. A very bloody battle. And also, as we know, uh, the inspiration for the Gettysburg Address, which followed after the, the war after the uh, battle. So again, it has a very good visitor center as to what led up to the Civil War, all about the different battles. These are maps of where the different troops go, and I'm not going to even try to tell you all about the movements of the trips and the different days. Some of the generals from the Union uh, and from uh, the, um, uh, the South, the Confederacy. So here are some of the things from the museum, uh, the Lincoln, Lincoln wins, um, some of the things from uh, the, the main generals, General Lee and General Meade, who uh, replaced General Hooker very uh, close to when the battle took place. So the Civil War, what was this all about? It was determining what kind of nation we would be. You notice in that Declaration of Independence, it says that all men are created equal. Yet, we had a country that was divided into slave-holding states in the South and free state, free uh, people in the North. 
And this was not resolved and could not be resolved with their first attempts at a constitution. And so uh, almost 100 years passed before we fought a war over what, we, what we kind of nation we wanted to be. And it resolved two fundamental questions, whether the United States was to be a nation, dissolvable confederation of states who could do whatever they wanted, or an indivisible nation with a national government. And the other was whether this nation was going to have free men uh, all created with an equal right to liberty, or whether it was continued as the largest slaveholding country in the world. About 100,000 soldiers fought at Gettysburg, and nearly half of those were killed. So that's a huge cost. After three days of fighting, Lee and his army retreated back to Virginia. And all things um, making sense, uh, it would have been uh, smart for the Union Army to follow after them and finish them off. But they were so decimated themselves that they really couldn't do it. Both, both uh, armies had to retreat, had to uh, retrieve their wounded and dying and, um, bur and burial, and neither one was able to continue for some time after that. But eventually the Union Army did win. Uh, the, um, Lee retreated into Virginia and uh, that was kind of a turning point. So the total cost of the war, 625,000 lives, 28% of the Army of the Potomac. That's the name of that. So this is the name of the Union Army, Union of the Potomac, and 37% of the Army of Northern Virginia, the, Un the uh, Confederate. That's just huge casualties. And that toll is as many American soldiers as died in all the other wars that we've ever fought in, just in this one battle. So as you uh, go around the battlefield, you can see things. This is now a preserved, it was farmland. It is now preserved as a battlefield uh, that you can visit. One of the big battles was the Battle of Little Round Top and, and Devil's Den, where of course there was protection from soldiers and uh, pickets charged, led up the hill and where they were just slaughtered. Just slaughtered. Just really a, a terrible, terrible war. So uh, the, the people who fought in this war, who were casualties, are buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. So we have a national uh, battlefield and a national cemetery there. You see some of them as the, the un un unknown sort of soldiers. All through the battlefield and through the cemetery there are state monuments to the, the soldiers from each of these states that fought there. So uh, there are just a lot of these. These is the one from the state of Virginia, seeing it from the back. This uh, is this part from the front of it, from the state of Virginia. And I'm looking at the soldiers buried here. So of course this is where, Je uh, where uh, Lincoln came after the battle to give his Gettysburg Address a good way to see the, the battlefield is to do this virtual tour where you can get an auto tour and it tells you where to stop and what you're looking at. And you can get this even if you're at home. You can, you can get this and, and see pictures of where it is or you can actually drive around in your car or a, bu a bus if you're with a tour or whatever and, and do that. And you get that from, from the National Park here. Um, let's move on now to Washington, D.C., and this has so much history in it, I uh, couldn't even start to tell you everything about it. But let's begin with the main part of Washington, D.C., of where the historical things are, and that is the Washington Mall. It's about two miles long, so if you're thinking of walking, just, just, a, just an FYI on that. Uh, there are two streets alongside of it. That Theoretically, there's a circulator bus that goes around here. Uh, I have yet to see it. I've been to Washington a couple of times, and if there is one, it's sure making itself scarce. Uh, along the mall, there are m many, many museums. The White House is off, uh, off to one side. Uh, it's um, got Lincoln Memorial on one end and the uh, Capitol on the other end with the Washington Monument in the middle. This is the way it was laid out in the beginning in 1901. It looks pretty much like that now. The uh, basin doesn't have that island in, but other than that, it looks pretty much like that. So it was laid out as a capital city, as a district of Columbia. So the idea was with James Madison said he wanted the national capital to not be a state or part of a state, but distinct from the states and provide its own maintenance and safety, which it does. 
They wrote it into the Constitution. They laid out a District of Columbia that would be our national capital. And that main a plan of the city with uh, these um, streets that ran, it ran out at angles was laid out by George Washington along the, the Potomac River, which is a fairly swampy place, about a 10 mile square, uh, and mostly in Virginia, a little bit of it in Maryland. We know that the city was attacked during the War of 1812 and the they burned the Capitol and they burned the White House, uh, both of which were restored. And the Capitol was actually under construction during the Civil War. Um, and it, even though it had been started earlier, it was under construction and Lincoln did not want that construction to stop during the Civil War, so that continued. The District of Columbia doesn't have any representatives in Congress it's governed by the U.S. government, so there is one of the committees that is the governing body of the uh, District of Columbia. They do have, I believe it's three electors in the Electoral College for President. Uh, this is the, state ca the United States Capitol, of course, and you see the population of the city of Washington, D.C., which is more than some states have, so they are periodically requesting to be represented in the um, Senate and the uh, House of Representatives at this point they're not. So here are just some pictures from Washington. As I say, I've been there several times since I have friends in the area and I've been able to be there to see various monuments. You can't see them all in one sitting, uh, even in a couple days. Uh, it, it takes repeated trips to Washington to even make a dent in the museums and monuments that are in this in the city. World War II monument I visited with a friend whose father was killed at Normandy. She was particularly interested in this one. And of course, you're gonna follow your interests in uh, Washington to see the things that maybe speak to you or have some family uh, interest. So the Lincoln Memorial here in daytime here at sunset. And since I didn't uh, have the beautiful picture that the Washington Post had, I'm gonna show that one to you of the statue of Lincoln, which is inside. This is the Vietnam Memorial with the, the names of the people killed in Vietnam, soldiers killed in Vietnam, the White House, the ellipse and the gardens. Now there's a fence around it. This is called the Castle of the Smithsonian Museum. If you think you're gonna to go to the museum here, you're really not. It is only the headquarters for a whole slew of museums run by the Smithsonian Institute. And this is not a uh, an up-to-date list. They've added some more since then, including the American, I mean, the Museum of the African American, which I did see on one of my last trips there. Uh, this one is one of the uh, uh, art museums, the Hirshhorn, um, and these art museums are really beautiful. This one of, of American art, they didn't have room for it, so they put it down. <coughs> You'd go in and it's down seven stories. Uh, and it's just a knockout museum. It has beautiful African art in it, as they all do. The National Gallery, of course, has some of the very famous painters and sculptors of all time. Uh, their works are here and in the annex across the street. So if you have time, uh, I, I came to this building and came in and said, was the... Um, architect of this annex building by any chance I am pay, P-E-I. She said, yes, it is. And I said, well, because it looks like the uh, Meyerson Symphony Hall in Dallas. Also, the architect was I am pay. It looks very much like it. He certainly has his signature on it. The Museum of the, the Indian, um, National Museum of American Indian, also looked familiar. We saw a similar building by Douglas Cardinal, the architect in Ottawa, or just across and actually in Quebec. Also a beautiful building with all the curving lines, uh, which, would, which would be uh, true of, of the American indigenous people. This is the, America, the African American Museum. It has three stories below and five stories above. You start below in the days of slavery and work yourself up through these uh, circular places to the uh, prominent African Americans today. As I say, it opened in, 19, in, in 2016, and I went to see it in fall of that year, I think the next month. And so it was just mobbed with people waiting to see this new museum in it. Uh, really a knockout job on it, just a, a great museum. Another one, uh, a relief that's at the um, um, 
I, I still I can't see my captions. The uh, this one from the portrait gallery. I'm sorry. In in this this one is also the uh, the original Declaration of Independence. The National Portrait Gallery is interesting because some of the, pi the pictures you've always seen, that's where they are. The originals are in there. But there are other things there, too, that I found were really interesting. If you applied for a patent, as Edison did here for his phonograph, uh, there's a portrait of him. There's a, port a picture of I mean, his actual model that he had to present to apply for his patent and his patent application. So there are all these patents and uh, who the, the uh, inventors were in the uh, portrait gallery. Went, so it, it turns out to be a really interesting one to go to. If you haven't been there, that's one you might want to try. Mount Vernon, of course, is in Alexandria across the river. A little bit of construction on that. The home of our first president, uh, Nash, uh, George Washington. And also uh, Arlington Cemetery is in uh, Arlington, Virginia. And this is a beautiful place to visit as well. Well, there it goes, okay. And I'm not sure why the flag was at half staff that day. Uh, we have the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and there's a soldier who marches back and forth 24 hours a day. The, um, there are many monuments all through the cemetery. This one was when the Challenger uh, exploded. And of course, you remember the one for John Kennedy, the Eternal Flame is there as well. Moving to Williamsburg. We're going to get there, people. We are, we are. Um, this one, we have another uh, living history museum. It was an early capital of Virginia three, on 300 acres. And interpreters also will answer questions as if they are residents in, and they're living there in 1700s. They will debate the day's issues of you, whether they should uh, King, tell King George to stuff it or what they were doing. You can take uh, tours of the buildings. Uh, there are lots of hotels and things to stay at, tours that go there. The main drag here is the Duke of Gloucester Street. This is in the town of Williamsburg, not to be confused with the historic area, area of Williamsburg. Uh, Governor's Palace, uh, the first capital in Virginia, and the College of William and Mary, and the Raleigh Tavern, where some of these folks like Patrick Henry, Henry and Thomas Jefferson would stop for an ale and uh, debate the issues of the day. So the first capital there was here. Here's the uh, Raleigh Tavern, the governor's house, which you can visit. You notice all the guns in the ceiling and along the walls in the entrance hall and uh, interesting rooms to see. This is just one from the kitchen. So the streets of Williamsburg are like streets in the 1700s. This little church, it has a graveyard, of course. But Ooh, go, back, go back to the church real fast. Sure. Can you do that? Yeah. So I think, Jack, didn't your sister get married in that church? Yes. My, my sister and brother-in-law were married in Bruton Parish Church. That's it, Bruton Parish Church. Yeah, he, um, he had a relative who was head of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh-huh. Old strings. <laughs> Well, you're probably not the only one who's able to do that. But yes, there's some uh, lovely buildings there. Uh, interesting to see. And as you're going through, uh, you can see some of the things that, as in the other ones that we saw, like at Plymouth and Mystic, um, things, uh, uh, occupations of, of this lady's knitting, and she, she's, she's in front of a jewelry shop. Here would be the Patrick Henry interpreter who was um, debating some of the issues or telling you some of the issues that they would have been important to people at, at the, in those days, and a freed slave who uh, was doing the same kind of thing, speaking for uh, his um, cause. So just some of the uh, homes. And of course, you had fancier furniture if you had a little bit of wealth. We had a little drum and fife and drum corps come through while we were there. Monticello, home of Thomas Jefferson, up on a hill. And as you come up the hill from uh, near Charlottes, uh, Charlottesville, um, you come to a wonderful apple orchard. And if it's fall, I recommend the apples. They were wonderful. So just, just to be sure we're clear on this, Charlottesville is in Virginia. Charlotte, North Carolina is uh, in North Carolina. So if you're doing a Washington thing, you could do Washington. You can do some of the... Um, 
uh, <coughs> Appalachian, uh, Shenandoah, <coughs> Shenandoah National Park, Monticello, Richmond is also very rich in history, Williamsburg, and come on down. <coughs> so Jefferson inherited this land from his father at a very early age and began designing his house. It was never really finished. It was a plantation of 5,000 acres. He, he grew tobacco to begin with, but then uh, later different crops, wheat and other things. And of course, it was all run by slave labor. He inherited, of course, slaves were property, which was part of the problem with the Civil War. They, they didn't want their property being taken away. Uh, they inherited, he inherited from his father and father-in-law, and over his lifetime there had about 600 different slaves. Uh, some were, lived there about five and six generations worth. <coughs> he moved into one of the outbuildings in 1700s, but he was constantly working on the house till he died. He ran out of money, uh, actually. He was married to Martha Skelton. She, uh, they had six children, but only two, two survived. One of the daughters died at 25. The other daughter was Thomas Jefferson's uh, hostess when he entertained. And of course, uh, we know, and he never remarried, but we know that he had a long-term affair with Sally Hemings, one of his slaves, and as I found out, uh, the half-sister of Martha Skelton. Uh, she was, she was, uh, her mother was a half, a half sister to Martha Skelton, rather. So they had six children, and again, uh, only two survived. So if you're visiting this, it's a national monument, natural historic landmark. Uh, you would come in, uh, park your car, and they would take you in a little shuttle bus up here to the entrance. This would be the house right here, with some uh, buildings that are below grade level here. You can't see them from the front. But there are uh, vegetable gardens, there are orchards, there's a cemetery on the ground uh, where Jefferson was buried. So as you look at the house from the front, it doesn't look like much. But it is 11,000 square feet. He added this as one of his additions later on, this rotunda building. This is the back of the building. And the uh, little walkways around so you can get a nice uh, little walk through the park. <coughs> Jefferson was... Uh, a multi-talented man, a, a brilliant um, architect, uh, designer, uh, inventor. Uh, he was third president. He died on the 4th of July, the same day as John Adams. He is buried here. It does not say on his tombstone that he was president of the U.S. It did list some of his other accomplishments. So he was uh, involved in the political scene for a long time. And as vice president, he was vice president under the second president, John Adams. And the way they did it, the way it was set up in the Constitution, was that the president was the one who got the most electoral votes, and the vice president was second runner-up. So they were in different parties, and they didn't get along very well. Surprise, surprise. So this was one of the amendments to the Constitution, where the vice president got his own votes separately. And then, of course, he was uh, president, the third, third president. And some of the things he was especially famous for during his tenure as president was purchasing half of what is now the United States from France, who were short of cash and they wanted the $15 million for it, and he did it. He authorized Lewis and Clark to go see what was there, which they did on their wonderful three-year ex uh, expedition. And some of those things are in the, uh, the uh, entranceway to his house. Uh, when the uh, Library of Congress was burned down in uh, the War of 1812, he donated his a library to restore the um, Library of Congress. That is the basis of it even today. So this is the uh, entrance to it. There are the three archways right here as you come in the front door. Uh, these were public rooms on the side, the dining room and parlors. He, this is his private living quarters. This is his bed between two rooms, <coughs> which you'll see in a picture in a minute. So he, after, he, uh, after his uh, tenure as president was over, he did Designed the University of, of Virginia. Uh, there are many uh, novel um, inventions in this house. There's, there's these three archways you come into the uh, into his office uh, in the interior. This little bed between his sitting room and his study. Uh, these are below level. Th this would be the from the front of the house, um, where these are just storerooms down below. <coughs> but an interesting house with all its gadgets that he invented. 
Uh, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, is in, comes to into our history with the, the first flight on the Outer Banks at Kitty Hawk. This is an interesting map because it does show uh, the um, road, uh, the uh, road through sh through Shenandoah and the uh, Parkway down to Smoky Mountain National Park, and also the Appalachian Trail, which joins it coming through Shenandoah, which runs from. Georgia to Maine. Uh, what we're going to look at today is these islands right here called the Outer Banks. And where we're looking at is this is the island that's occupied, has some little towns on it, lots of uh, tourist uh, att attractions and um, uh, places to stay, condos, uh, hotels, and so forth. Uh, Kitty Hawk, I stayed with an Evergreener in Kitty Hawk. Uh, Kill Bell Devil Hills is a small rise where these um, first flight took place, the National Seashore and Ocracoke. So these are the three main islands, Kitty Hawk, Nags Head, then the uh, Hatteras National Seashore with the Hatteras Lighthouse, and Ocracoke Island with uh, only the ferries. The, these two are joined by bridges. And when you come to Ocracoke Island, they will ask you, do you have a place to stay tonight? Because the last ferry has gone. and. Uh, <laughs> If you don't, you're not going to have any place to stay. You need to go back to where there's some hotels. So the Cape, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was moved. It's an interesting one. It was moved about 150 feet away from where it was eroding. So just a few pictures from the islands. Uh, this is at Kitty Hawk. Looks green and lots of trees, little bays where people have their boats. This on uh, down a little farther at Nags Head, all these uh, beach houses. And then you, when you cross the bridge into the National Park, National Seashore, um, it's quiet and people are flying kites and you can listen to the seagulls. Uh, the island down at the, the, at the end of it, Ocracoke Island, has a little bay on it with, with uh, houses. You can uh, get a hotel and um, restaurants here and get ferries to the mainland. So if you're going to see what happened with the Wright Brothers, the place to start is the Visitor Center. And these are the, where the, the Wright brothers made their first uh, flight from, from this little hill here, Kill Devil Hill, on December 17th, 1903. This is Wilbur and Oroville. They were from Dayton, Ohio, bicycle shop owners, but inventors in their own right. And they'd been working on flight for quite a while. And they first, um, they tried out different uh, gliders, but they, they had some problems with a lot of different things. So this is where they got their first one really off the ground. They had a little wind, they had a little uh, hill to fly off of, the Wright Flyer 1. They stayed aloft 12 whole seconds and covered 120 feet. That doesn't sound like much, but it had never been done before. It had a wingspan of 40 feet, weighed 605 pounds, and gasoline engines. And they did a couple other flights that day. Their third one went 852 feet almost a minute. And, but the highest altitude of any of those flights was 10 feet. So they came back and uh, 10 feet off the ground. So they came back in, in a couple of years and completed 24 miles. So they were on the right track. Here's their plane. This was taken as the first flight. Look at where the shadow is. They are off the ground. The uh, state of Carolina, when we had the uh, quarters come out for each state, look at the, the picture. Okay. See the similarities. Uh, actually, <laughs> this is misleading. It looks like the flight happened in 1789. That's when they were a state, but um, became a state. But this is uh, the brothers and their house in Dayton. They added the porch later on. And the, the people, their crew setting up their flight. This is from the museum. And you get some interesting ranger talks. They had to, uh, Orville had to lie on it and, and uh, run it from there. There wasn't a place to sit the, where we would see a plane now. These wings were made of fabric. The, the sewing machine that where they made the wings is, is in that museum. So in order to fly a machine, you had these problems. You had to get it off the ground. You had to keep it running. And you had to be able to control it. You had to make those wings be able to up and go down. You be, had to be able to turn it. Uh, so these were the problems that they were working on. And not just the rights, but other people here in the US and in Europe we're working on the issues of flight and how to do it. And at first, even the Dayton pub paper didn't publish it, but 
they, they, they word finally got around that they had done something wonderful in, in 1903 and they of course became famous and and uh, started a uh, airplane company. So there are other uh, people who are involved in flight over the years ending up with our astronauts, uh, the most recent. And uh, so it's a wonderful place to visit if you're interested in aviation. St. Augustine is our last one, and I promise it's going to be short and end. So you can find all kinds of funky stuff, including the alligator farm. Uh, again, there were people who came here, but they didn't stay. But the first one to stick his flag in the ground was from Spain. So he named it St. Augustine after his patron saint, because that was his feast day. Uh, look out early, it was settled much earlier than Plymouth. So when we talk about Plymouth being our first English settlement, not so. Um, this was a Spanish settlement, but it was settled before Jamestown, and be which was English, and before um, uh, Plymouth, which was, which was English. So this is a Spanish settlement. So Spain ceded Florida, the United States, and uh, it became a state, at first a territory, then a state in 1848. So it does have a nice uh, fort and a nice lighthouse. It's on the east coast of, of Florida. A little uh, old map, you can see the fort. Remember in the Caribbean, if you saw that one, there were forts all through the Caribbean because first of all, there were pirates and there were all kinds of visitors who wanted to claim it, but if they didn't stay there or build their fort or run other people off, that didn't happen. So um, the French, the English, the British were all Netherlands were all through the Caribbean, including Florida. Place to start again is the visitor center. You can take a little tour through St. Augustine on the ghost train. So you see the uh, first founding in 1565. A little bit about the fort. They have a nice uh, map of the town in the floor. How convenient. The uh, lighthouse and an aerial view of the fort. And this is the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument begun in 1672, and it's in pretty good shape. It's been restored. You can visit it. This is the oldest house in St. Augustine, and I, if anybody asked me what year, I didn't ever find out what the year was. But if they started out in 16, 1565, we can assume it's pretty old. Uh, here's one of the interesting hotels, and of course, we can step back in time in a lot of places. So a statue of Pedro Mendez is, is in this courtyard, but the building is what I want to call your attention to. This is a Flagler building. Henry Flagler is somebody you will get to know if you ever go to St. Augustine because he was a partner with Rockefeller and Standard Oil, and he arrived in the 1880s, and his stamp is all over this city. He was interested in turning this into a winter resort for for all these Canadians and New Yorkers who wanted to come to Florida in the winter. What a, what a concept, right? <laughs> so he bought out all the local railroads and got them all running together so they, they, there were no gaps, made them into the Florida East Coast Railroad and all the way up the East Coast. So they are based in St. Augustine. He built hotels, resorts, churches, a college named after him. He made it possible for people to come to Florida. This is the, one of his hotels, the Hotel Ponce de Leon, of course, named after one of the Portuguese explorers who came this way. So you see this stucco and red tile all over St. Augustine. You can thank Flagler and thank Flagler. Just a couple of pictures, the old gate from 1861 as it looks today. The beautiful bridge, look at the nice work, the Lions Gates Bridge and one of the little um, uh, gazebos, and I'm going to end with the uh, beautiful bay at Ocracoke Island, beautiful in fall when all the visitors have gone home, and you have a nice quiet evening. And we're going to end with that. So I am just about at an hour. Wow, Mary. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that was amazing. So that's more than you really wanted to know. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just love all your research. You had all my questions answered. Well, I hope. I, I've got 79 pages of notes, so I hope you don't ask me too many questions that I have to look up. <laughs> and I talked as fast as I could. And it just you did. You did great. You did wonderfully. My goodness. But, it, 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 you know, all these are different trips. This is not one trip. 
so that's something to keep in mind. If you, if, like Kathleen was saying at the beginning, if you live near it somewhere or want a little trip to some of these, there's <laughs> more than I have told you in some of these areas. So um, there's just so much to see. And uh, this is just, just dealing with the historic stuff. I have another whole one on scenic East Coast. <laughs> So, oh, really? Um, and of course, there are some scenic things in here, but this is mainly uh, looking at the history and what you can find if you're a history buff. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, there were some questions or comments. Let me just yeah, see. Um, oh, early on, you were talking about some battles. And there's the battles at Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. Yeah, I started saying Brandywine, and I thought, nope, that's Revolutionary War. <laughs> and I have to stop and think about what was the battle right before that? It was Fredericksburg that that um, they did have a victory. This uh, the uh, uh, Confederate Army had a victory, uh, had uh, victories there, but uh, they didn't make it at um, at Gettysburg. That was a turning point for the Union. Okay. Um... Oh, and the I.M. Pays Annex to the National Gallery oh, no. that says there are no 90 degree angles, no right angles in the building. I did not know that. <laughs> but I saw lots of other things that looked like our, our symphony hall that had his fingerprint all over it. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, Jack also said that he worked as a tour guide at Monticello oh. while he was going to college at UVA. So um, I thought of, I love to go through the historic homes and I thought Monticello was one of the most fascinating because it did have so many of his inventions incorporated into the building. And, you know, they weren't just um, like a side on shelves in a, just to look at, you could see, um, like his, I believe his, either the doors out the back or the front door um, had double doors and he had it set up under the floor that if you open one side or if the butler or whoever opened one side, both doors would open at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, full of it's full of, I didn't, I didn't even start on that. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I guess I'm a gadget person, so I thought, you know, so if you ever can, haven't been to Monticello and have the opportunity, I think it would be well worth your time yeah. to do that. Um, and many of these places I stayed with Evergreeners. Yes. Many, many of them. Yes, and I think that's one of the... Um, <clears throat> real pluses for your, for your talk is that there are evergreeners all up and down the East Coast. And so you could find someone pretty close to where you wanted to go. And if I can say one thing about the Outer Banks, um, I was there in at the end of September, which is actually a good time to go because um, it is very crowded in the summertime. My, my children from Raleigh have been in Nags Head in the, in the summer. It's very congested, you know, there's only one lane going each way, it's just a barrier island that sand is shifting. Uh, so it, it, you know, it's, it's not a good time to go. I, I know you'd like to go to the barrier islands and you have that nice, nice breeze off the ocean in the summertime, but in fall things kind of slow down and, and close. That's another thing that at Ocracoke Island, uh, there was one restaurant open when I got there. Uh, Ooh, wow. I did get a, a reservation at a hotel uh, earlier on, but the, the background of my screen here is, too is at Ocracoke Island in the sunset. Let me get out of the way. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but it was very peaceful and quiet and along the beach at the seashore, uh, you know, kids were flying kites and hang gliders and things like that. There are a couple of places where you can eat or get gas or something like that, but basically, the, you know, there are no homes or anything on the seashore. So it's a nice, quiet, pretty place to be, but you can't stay there overnight. You have to go north or south. Okay. But you can't. Does anyone have any other questions about the program? 
And I think you covered <laughs> your well, seven you pages. Want to know. <laughs> I have to go back and watch the YouTube now. How many how many people were lost at Gettysburg again? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Jody? Hi, everybody. I live in Florida now, but I, I want to thank you, Mary. We're not related. We're not. Um, despite our last name. But um, just want to say this was a wonderful uh, reminiscence in part for me, my husband now deceased. But we spent um, three years going up and down the Atlantic intracoastal waterway yeah. from... Uh, uh, north of Boston down to almost Key West and and all of the places that you mentioned other than the obvious inland places like Monticello but many of those we visited by small sailboat oh, off and goodness. on off and on over three years uh, three round trips mm -hmm. so the um, it was just wonderful I, I want to endorse your excellent encouragement of learning learning the East Coast history. Um, it's all so full of nature. And, and when I saw the sailboats, I thought, if I can recommend a way to go, um, take your small sailboat or your little trawler. And uh, uh, there are cruises also, American Cruise Line now does um, intercoastal waterway cruises uh, for good chunks. It's, it's all beautiful. Of course, things are getting built up. And the shorelines are changing. I mean, there's so much. So yeah, don't, don't uh, delay. But I love the East Coast. There's a lot there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jody. I have the daughters in Raleigh and in Philadelphia. You know, I've gone there so many times. I've, I've driven there. And then I have friends and Evergreeners all, all through there. So uh, I've made many trips there. But so I haven't even touched on so many things. and. Uh, my, one of my favorite places is Shenandoah National Park. I just love that. I think I've been there eight times. Uh, if I haven't stayed overnight at um, the Skyland Lodge, at least I've had lunch there. And it's right on the Appalachian Trail, so you can see people with their backpacks walking right by. But yeah, um, just, just wonderful, wonderful country.